the Haggai chapter 1. Let's see if we can get this working again. Haggai chapter 1. And while you're turning, don't forget on the table is a little memo pad. And if you wouldn't mind at some point, just uh, write the date down and everybody in your family who is with you today. And that's how we keep a record of attendance. I want us to take a few weeks and look at this short book, the prophet Haggai. Give you a few moments. You've had a week. I was supposed to start last week, and God had other things, and so you've had a week to figure out where it is in your Bibles. So uh, hopefully you can uh, uh, find it. If not, go to the concordance and and look. But just a little two chapter prophecy, Haggai, building God's temple. This is what I want us to look at today is really we look at the entire first chapter or at least read uh, the first chapter and try to make some applications for us. But here's the big thought. You'll see it in just a second on the screen, but I want to go ahead and give you kind of the the big thought that then the sermon is going to be uh, built around. And that thought is this. The difficult thing is not in the starting of something, but in the finishing of that which you started. Now, I think you know what that means, but just by way of illustration, all of us, if we had the chance, would probably tell you when we started something. It could have been uh, a school uh, that you wanted to go to school or graduate school or, or maybe it was a project around the house. Uh, you started, you had this idea, you were going to do it, or maybe it was a new venture. You were going to uh, start your own company, or your own business, or, or you were going to finally turn your life around, and so you committed yourself uh, to sobriety, and maybe you even went to rehab, or you decided you were going to do it yourself, but you started something, and that was the easy part, just saying, I'm going to do this. But the hard part is trying to see something which you started through to completion. And so after a while, really, because of discouragement, or if you've lived a while and you've started things and you've never been able to finish what you started, well, then after a while, some people just stop trying to do anything at all. Yeah, that's a good idea. I really like to do it, but I know I'm not going to finish it, so I just don't want to start. Now, perfectionists are like that. I'm not going to ask you here in this room, who are you a perfectionist? If you're a firstborn child, you already know you are. But, the, but it, in perfectionism, you see this. Either you can, you can look at a person's desk at work, or you can look at their house, or you can look at their bedroom if they're still uh, uh, living at home. And a perfectionist, either the room is going to be completely spotless, everything in place, or it's going to be incredibly messy. Because the perfectionist finally says, you know, if I can't do it right, I'm just not going to do it at all. And so we're like that. We start something, but we don't finish. And then after a while, that becomes a habit. And so after a while, we just decide to quit even trying to do anything. Nearly 100 years ago, the residents of Cincinnati, Ohio, had a dream to ease the downtown congestion by traveling in an underground tunnel or underground rail. And so the city already owned a major form of the right-of-way in the area. It was the Erie Canal. In the early 1900s, the canal had fallen into disuse and just became nothing more than an open sewer. And so to alleviate health concerns and traffic problems, the city of Cincinnati planned to drain the waterway and build a subway system using the bed of the canal. The project was conceived in 1916. In 1928, the project was completely stopped. And as of 2017, the project is still incomplete and abandoned. It was a good idea, but what happened? Well, there were three things that happened. One was a political change. The new administration at that time didn't want to do it. Second of all was economic hardships. It was more expensive than they thought. And then the Great Depression hit them. And then third was World War I. And so they started something, and to this day, still not complete. You see, again, the difficult thing is not in the starting of something, but in the finishing of that which you started. And in this short prophetic book of Haggai, we see the importance of finishing what you start. Finishing what you start. Now, Haggai is a short prophetic book, just two chapters. And it deals with only one topic, the rebuilding of the temple. That's all it talks about. The rebuilding 
of the temple. Now we know very little about the prophet Haggai himself, except that more than likely he was in his 70s when he prophesied this and when he wrote these things down, that's based on some internal evidence of the book. And we also know that his prophecy covered a period of four months. We know this based on the dates that he gives. Very quickly, look, here's just kind of an overview of this. Haggai gives us dates. He says, for example, in one, chapter 1, verse 1, in the second year of King Darius on the first day of the sixth month. Now, if you write in your Bibles, you could write a little note out to the side that says that that's August the 29th, 520 B.C. And then if you look on down in chapter 1 near the end, in, at the end of verse 14, it says, They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty their God on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. So that's just three weeks later. And so if you want to write it down, that's September the 19th, 520 B.C. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, On the 21st day of the seventh month, that's October 17th, 520 B.C. And then in chapter 2, verse 10, on the 24th day of the ninth month. And then again in, in verse 20 of chapter 2, the word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the ninth month. That's December the 18th, 520 B.C. And so he makes it clear. All we know about Haggai was that he was an older gentleman and his entire prophecy about rebuilding the temple just covers a span of four months. And so corresponding to these four dates are four short oracles or four short prophetic statements. And all of them have to do with rebuilding and restoring the temple. Now more than likely Haggai served as a prophet for a long time. But all we have is this particular prophecy about a particular event during a particular time in history. And so get this. Haggai spent his life in anonymity. Just serving God. His prophecy is rarely read and rarely preached about. And that's a shame. Because Haggai's prophecy is unique in the fact that the people actually listened to him and did what he said. A lot of the prophets spent their whole life prophesying and the people never listened to them. And the people turned on them and the people killed them. But here is Haggai, he gives just a very simple prophecy about rebuilding the temple and they actually did it. And so maybe there's something we can learn from him. Read with me. We're going to look at the end of the chapter and then go back. But follow along as I read Haggai chapter 1 verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shetilel, I need that app on my phone that pronounces all those. Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai. Because the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message to the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. You know, there's always that correlation between obeying God and then God being with us. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty their God on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. Now just a brief history. In 597 BC, Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, at some point in time the 12 nations of Israel were divided into two, the northern and the southern. 125 years earlier, the northern kingdom ceased to exist. And so you had Judah, the southern kingdom. And Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, was defeated by Babylon. And, and when they were defeated, a large group of Hebrews were deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. And Babylon is present-day Baghdad. And so more than likely, Haggai was one of those Jews deported from Jerusalem to Baghdad. Some 15 years later, in 582 B.C., Jerusalem was completely destroyed and the temple was demolished. And the people in Judah remained in exile until 538 B.C. for a total of 59 years. 
In 537 BC, the Persians conquered the Babylonians and having a more humane policy, gave permission for the Jews to return to Jerusalem and build the temple and get this. Not only did they let the Israelites go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, but the Persian government said that they would help finance the rebuilding. They would help pay for it. But yet in spite of that, only a small remnant returned to Jerusalem from captivity. Most of the, Jewish, of, of the Jewish people had established comfortable lives in Babylon and did not want to go back to Jerusalem. Now, how many of us are like that? We follow God, but then things get rough. We turn from God, but then we get so comfortable in our lives that when God says it's time to go back, we say, no, I don't want any part of that. I got it pretty good here. Now, we need to understand something. And that is the importance of the temple in the Jewish faith. You see, the temple symbolized the presence of God. And so when the temple is in disrepair or when the temple is destroyed, well, then there's a sense that God is no longer with his people. And so this idea of going back to rebuild the temple was a sign that God had now heard our prayers. He is sending us back home and now he is with us again and we can rebuild the temple as a symbol that now he is with us again. He had forgotten about us for 60 years, but now he is with us. And so a small group go back to rebuild the temple and the government had agreed to pay for it. However, within a year of returning, the people had only made a half-hearted attempt to rebuild the temple. And soon they lost interest in that project and turned their attention to building their own houses. In other words, they didn't finish what they started. And who could blame them? I mean, things were really not going very well. The people had to struggle daily just to get enough to eat. The economy was in shambles and the nearby Samaritans were hassling them. And so just dealing with the harsh realities of daily existence occupied most of their time and energy. How in the world can I have time for God when I'm just barely surviving myself? And 18 years after they had returned, the prophet Haggai appears on the scene to encourage them to finish what they had started. Look at chapter 1, verse 1. Now remember, the temple represented the presence of God in their lives. So without the temple, symbolically, God was not with them. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come for the Lord house to be built. Now, what an excuse. 18 years earlier, God had allowed them to go back home to rebuild the temple. The government said, we'll help finance it. They get there, things are rough. They got to build their own houses. So we'll get around to it one day. The timing's just not right. We gotta take care of ourselves first. And then we will make room for the presence of God in our life after we get our own lives together. Look at verse three. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? You're taking care of yourself but the presence of God is not in your life. Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but have harvested little. The economy is bad. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages, only to put them in a purse with holes in it. You got holes in your pocket. How many of you know through experience 
that the farther you are away from God, the more difficult life just seems to be. You just can't. Man, that opportunity came for me to work on Sundays. I'm going to take it. I'm going to make all this overtime. And man, your car breaks down, your refrigerator goes out, your stove goes bad, your house breaks down. All of a sudden, everything you thought you were going to make, what happens? God just takes it away. You see. What? You're working hard, but you never have enough. This, now, this is not because they're greedy, at least in this prophecy. It's just because no matter what they did, it was just hard work. Nothing was going right for them. Verse 7, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Second time he said that. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord God Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin, because you have put everything else ahead of me. While each of you is busy with his own house, therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, and whatever the ground produces on men and cattle and on labor of your hands. God is saying, I have withheld my blessings because you haven't finished the temple. Now, what has this got to do with us? Are we about to go into a building program? No. No. Capital N, capital O. No. We have made an intentional decision to spend our resources on people, not on concrete as a church. Here is the application. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? And that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. You see, building God's temple is no longer about a physical structure. But rather, it's about the present reality of God working in your life. So the question is, have you neglected building his temple? And are you concerned about lesser things? Pastor, I just wish I had time for God, but right now I just don't. I mean, my kids, the age they're in, I'm just so busy. I'll get around to it eventually. And God is saying, I have made things tough on you because you're taking care of yourselves, but you're not placing me in your life. You see, Haggai is about building your life. And if you look at it that way, his prophecy gives us three warnings. First, Haggai tells us, don't get sidetracked. I mean, the people went there with good intentions. They were going to rebuild the temple. But then when things got tough, they got sidetracked. How many times has that happened to us? We make a commitment to follow God. We make a commitment that we're going to uh, walk down this road and do the right thing. But then we get sidetracked and we forget all about it. Don't get sidetracked. Don't get discouraged. Here are the people. It was hard work. Even though the financing was there, they still had to go up in the mountains and cut their own lumber and bring it down. And they had to do all this. And the whole time they were trying to build this temple, their own houses were in disrepair. And so they got discouraged. Don't let anyone ever tell you that following Jesus is easy. It is the most difficult thing you will do. You see. And so do not get discouraged when all of a sudden, because you follow Jesus, people start attacking you. People start talking about you. People start getting in your way. And all of a sudden you think, no, I can't do this. I got to go back and just take care of myself. Don't get discouraged. And then don't quit. That's what Haggai was saying. Look, just don't quit. Remember. 
The difficult thing is not in the starting of something, but in the finishing of that which you started. So today, God is admonishing us to keep going in our lives and to keep building a life that will bring him honor. But how do we do that? How can we build the temple of our lives for him? Well, we read some of it, but let's go back. If you would turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Remember, the temple, the presence of God is now within us, not in a building. How do we build God's temple? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Building God's temple, Jesus is your foundation. Don't ever forget that. No, long, no matter how long you've been following Jesus, never forget that he is your foundation. And if you try to build your life on anything else, you're going to fail. No matter how much success you have in life, Jesus is your foundation. No matter how difficult life is, Jesus is your foundation. Through the good, through the bad, through the ups and the downs, Jesus is your foundation. And that is what you build your life on. Anything else will be destroyed. So here is Paul saying to the people in Corinth, I have built this foundation. I have talked to you about Christ. But now you're letting other people come in and influence you to other things. Build your foundation on Jesus Christ. Then look what he says in verse 12. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. Jesus is your foundation. All other foundations are weak. You see, we start out following Christ. We start out building this temple. And we know that we are saved by faith and, and through grace in Jesus Christ. And so we're building on that foundation but after a while, we start to deceive ourselves. They say, you know what, in, in, on top of that foundation, I need to build good works, I need to do this, I need to do that, da, 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 da. And then before you know it, we're more concerned about those things, and all of a sudden, uh, God comes and he tests our works, and it means nothing, because the only thing that matters is that the foundation was in Jesus Christ. All other foundations are weak. Oh, right. That's how a baby says amen. Thank you. Build your foundation on Jesus. All other foundations are weak. But then look at verse 14. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. You see, a life built, sorry about that misspelled word, a life built on Jesus will last forever. Now, God in his grace, we may get sidetracked. We may put other things before him at times, but Jesus is going to burn all that away and then he still sees that our foundation is on Christ and so he says, you will be saved even if by fire. 
You see, all a life built on Jesus will last forever. And then look at verse 16. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. Just recognize that you are God's temple. God lives in you. If you have confessed Christ as your savior, well then in a sense you were in a foreign land, you were held captive, Jesus Christ has set you free, now you can go home and start rebuilding that temple and you take that step of faith and you follow Jesus. And you build that temple. The Holy Spirit is in you. You see. We are God's temple. Now among other things that means we need to treat ourselves as God's temple. Which means we should take care of ourselves. Take care of ourselves spiritually. Take care of ourselves emotionally. Take, take care of ourselves physically. You know, used to a long, 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 long time ago when I was in a church that had a building, <laughs> long, long, long time ago, we, and I was a teenager, we would have these lock-ins, you know, where teens would come together and, you know, usually play in the basement. Well, in the middle of the night, nothing going on, you need more space, we'd go up into the auditorium, the sanctuary, and start playing. Maybe hit a volleyball back and forth probably doing things we shouldn't do. And then all of a sudden, word would get out and people would get upset and say, you can't do that in God's house. And I remember as a kid thinking, that's ridiculous. My Bible tells me that this is the house of God. And then the thought hit me, well, you know, anything you wouldn't do in church, you probably shouldn't do to yourself. <laughs> Does that make sense? Because this is God's temple. Man, that affects me. Every time I think of that, I'm like, man, I got to get back on a diet. That's the first thing that comes to my mind. Man, I got to start taking care of myself. This is God's temple. And we start out following God, but then we get distracted and we walk away and we get frustrated and all that kind of stuff. And now here is the prophet Haggai coming to us and saying, look, you are concerned about all of these things that are not really important. When you said you were going to build God's temple and you haven't, You've gotten sidetracked. So now go up into the mountains, get that wood and stuff, and build God's temple. Build your life on him. Right? Build God's temple. Now, here's the thing. The people listened to Haggai, and they did what he said and started rebuilding the temple. So what are we gonna do? The difficult thing is not in the starting of something, but in the finishing of that which you started. You started this walk of faith, it's gotten difficult, and maybe you kinda stumbled along the way, and Haggai is saying, pick it up, get back on track, start again, and let's finish the job. Let's finish it. Are you willing to obey the prophet Haggai? And then the Spirit of God says, I will be with you. Building God's temple. Building our lives on the foundation that is Jesus Christ. With every head bowed and every eye closed. We started the communion portion of the service in the Word with prayer, and let's finish that with prayer. You've confessed your sins, and now just in the quietness of this moment, look to God and say, God, help me just to continue and to finish what I've started following you. Lord, thank you for this reminder that our foundation is on Jesus Christ and anything else is not going to last. And that now because of Christ 
It is our bodies that are the temple and your spirit resides within us. So help us, Lord, to build our temples. Maybe your prayer is, Lord, I, I've gone down this path for a while, but I've kind of got sidetracked. And today, Lord, I just want to get back. I want to listen to Haggai and start building again. Start making room for the Spirit in my life. Putting God first above all things. Lord, I pray that's our prayer. Father, I pray that we leave here today encouraged to follow you even more knowing that you have already prepared the path. You have already made things plain if we would just keep following you. Lord, in this story, the Persian government said, we will pay for the temple, but yeah, they still got sight. Lord, you have already made the way. And now let us follow you, Father. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this time of worship. Thank you for each person who is here. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you would stand and let's say our prayer together. This is our prayer at FCC. Say this with me. As we leave this place of worship and fellowship, let us commit ourselves to love and serve God by loving and serving our neighbors. You're dismissed. Thank you.